Hi folks, my name is Girish Bali, the host for Back to Basics, another Back to Basics for another week. Today we're going to talk about comedy. And it seems like this person uh, that I got in touch with, I don't know how many weeks ago, how many months ago, or whatever it is, but I'm just glad he's here. And he's going to share all the stuff that he talks about, what he has done and what he's not done in the comedy uh, industry. And then we'll talk to him about his book and all the other extra stuff in there. So let's invite Art Bell into this uh, show and let's talk and let's chit chat with Art. Art, how are you? And thanks for coming to Back to Basics. Hey, Girish. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Absolutely. Before we get into the details of what you do, what you don't do, and everything else what we do, uh, what does Back to Basic mean to you, Art? Back to Basics? Well, I, you know, I mean, I uh, had a, a long and varied career. I worked as an economist. I worked as a consultant. I worked in, in the comedy business. I worked uh, at another uh, television channel called um, Court TV, learned about mm. judicial, the judicial system. Mm. Uh, and you know what? I mean, really, uh, the basics are what served me best. You know, the basic understanding of what management is, of what leadership is, uh, and how to uh, foment creativity among your staff. Mm. All of those things served me well in every job I had, uh, including, you know, right back to the beginning. I mean, not I mowed lawns. I, I, I don't think that mowing lawns at, at the age of 13, I really used a lot of the basic stuff that I ended up using in my career. But after that... Mm. Um, the basics were uh, really important to me. Yeah, absolutely. Art, thank you so much for coming on my show and explaining uh, your basic way and your basic uh, definition. So thank you again for that. Okay. So the words comedy, HBO, Comedy Central, what does that mean to you? <laughs> well, I, um, I started Comedy Central. It was actually called Comedy Channel when I started it. Right. In the late 80s, at while I was a financial analyst at HBO, and I wrote a memoir about it. Hmm. And I'll tell you, uh, writing the memoir gave me a chance to kind of evaluate, in hindsight, all the things that happened and all the things that I did, not just I did, everybody did. I mean, you know, it was kind of a group effort. Uh, but I did, I did want to get the, the book out there. I did want to do the memoir because Comedy Central, you know, it's been around for 30 years. Hmm. And when I talk to younger people, they say, oh, yeah, Comedy Central, it's always been around, it's always been successful. And I wanted to say that Comedy Central was not always successful. Hmm. I mean, when we first started it, when it was Comedy Channel, the first year, hmm. it was a disaster. It was a hmm. failure. I mean, I, I went to work every day thinking, okay, they are going to shut me down today. They're going to shut us down. They're going to fire me. I mean, it was just going so badly. The, the press was relentless in taking us apart. They said, it's not funny. What is HBO doing? And so I wanted to write this memoir to talk about the fact that comedy is hard and Comedy Central took a lot of work by a lot of people and almost didn't make it. Doesn't it sound like that when you're starting a brand new business, it's it's almost like that, right? But when you're starting something new, you don't know where to start. You don't know if you're going to make someone cry or, or have laugh, in this case, comedy right? Uh, you just have to start somewhere. You think that there's a comparison or there is no? Well, that was certainly the case uh, for Comedy Central. Um, remember, we had no, we had nothing, uh, you know, we had to plan this thing from scratch. We, we, it wasn't like we could say, okay, there's that comedy network over there. We'll mm. do it like that, but a little bit differently. Mm. Um, we were the first one. And we had to develop a comedy network and we didn't know what to put on it. We didn't know who our audience was going to be. We were really making it up as, as we went along. The mm. one thing that I kept holding on to throughout the whole process was there, there's going to be a comedy network in the world. It might as well be ours, you know? Sure. Sure. So, um, and one of the reasons I started, a, you know, I pitched the whole idea of a comedy network to HBO is because I really wanted to work at one. Mm. I loved comedy from the time I was a kid. And when I came out of business school, I did go to business school, I, um, I wanted to work in the television business. And I thought, you know, why isn't there a comedy channel? That would be really fun to work at. Mm. But there wasn't. 
Mm. And uh, so that's why I started talking to people about, hey, you know, what do you think about a comedy channel? Is that something that that you know is gonna is gonna happen, or we should do, or what would it look like? And people mm. generally said, yeah, it sounds like a cool idea, but nobody's ever gonna do it. And I say, why not? They say, mm. well, it's expensive. It's too expensive. Mm. Comedy is very expensive. You have to have writers. You know, original comedy is expensive. Uh, and I said, okay. So the trick is to find a way to do a comedy network that's not that expensive at the beginning. Mm. And they said, well, if you could do that, sure. So that's what I started thinking about. How are yeah. we going to do this inexpensively enough at the beginning so that people start saying, yeah, now it is a good idea. Yeah, thank you, thank you again, Art. But when you when you just uh, told a story about age thirteen and you always like comedy, right? Do you mean comedy telling jokes or comedy being a goofball? I mean, comedy <laughs> being a goofball. You know, you don't hear goofball as a term of comedy. Okay, so what do you call it nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But thank you for reintroducing it to me. Um, I I actually got interested in comedy because I saw it on television. You know, I was watching comedians on the Ed Sullivan show, which was a weekly variety show. And I saw, you know, the Borscht Belt comedians, Alan King um, and uh, Jackie Mason, those guys. Mm. And then I thought, wow, these guys are really powerful. They're getting the entire live audience to laugh. They're getting mm. the entire um country to laugh at the same time i mean not the entire country but you know a third of the country would watch the ed sullivan show at any one time and and that was a you know the, the whole idea that they could they could get everybody to laugh like that i wanted That's to right. know how that worked i wanted to i wanted to do that um so yeah as a kid i loved comedy and then as i got older yeah i i guess i i uh i got in trouble a lot in school for you know cutting up in class you know everybody would laugh and uh even the teacher sometimes, but they'd say, you know, you can't do that. So they'd mm. send me to the hall or the principal. Mm. But um, when I got to high school, I started writing comedy a little bit, you know, satire, actually. I got interested in satire. Mm. I got interested in uh, Swift, you know, A Modest mm. Proposal. Mm. And uh, started learning about satire. And then National Lampoon showed up, you know, in my life. And National mm. Lampoon was, of course, a great comedy entity comedy magazine in in mm. the 70s when i was in high school and uh they were my heroes so i started a an underground newspaper in high school mm. where we did satirical articles about school and yeah we got in trouble with that too um but it was you know it was fun and it's what i wanted to do and then i got to college more playing around in the comedy uh mm comedy at college you know doing some sketch uh and no stand-up i was not like very interested in doing stand-up mm. but i like comedy and of course i graduated from college and uh, got a job as an economist mm. but so that wasn't that wasn't going directly into the comedy business but uh, l let me ask you this there Go ahead. I i'm pretty sure there there's a difference but i i want to ask you the comedy in front of a tv or television uh, you know, or, or or even a movie, it's different from a stand-up comedian, correct? And and how is that different? Is it because you get a reaction right away from people versus a little delay on the TV? Or how does, what do you think? Um, well, I, you're talking about the difference between what stand-up comedians do and what comedy writers do. Okay. I mean, uh, and stand-up comedians are, of course, comedy writers. I mean, they hone their act uh and many of them write it it looks like it's improvised a lot of times but mm. you know mostly these guys are and gals are are trying to get a very solid act uh that is polished mm. so that when they get out on stage they're not making it up now of course there's exceptions i mean some comedians like to make things up they like to deal with the audience uh and improvise a little bit but for the most part you know they're thinking about what their bits are and what they're going to write down comedy writers sit if you're talking about sitcoms and comedy movies mm -hmm. you know i mean <laughs> each of those things has its own uh kind of flavor structure rules uh and you know there's a way it's done i mean sitcoms man that goes all the way back to to the honeymooners and i love lucy and uh 
Mm. And those those great old sitcoms, and they really set the standard for and the stage for uh, how sitcoms got done for the next whatever years. Of course, now we're in the age of Netflix and streaming, and you see all kinds of new ways to do sitcoms. Single mm-hmm. camera, meaning they look more like movies. That's uh, right. They're not done in front of a live audience. Um, so, yeah, I, but it's all comedy. It's all an attempt to make people laugh. Hmm. Uh, and it's all an attempt to make people laugh so, because it's okay. important for us to laugh. You know, it's important. But, you know, uh, all, all the comedies that I grew up with uh, back in the 70s and 80s, you know, the Three's Company, Mork and Mindy, uh, Dick Van Dyke Show, uh, all the uh, I Love Lucy. That was, that right? was the 60s, the Dick Van Dyke Show. <laughs> was it 60s? Yeah, I think old. it was 60s. Was yeah, so, but I, I saw the reruns, obviously. Ah, right. But uh, but when I saw those shows, it, it was quite different as to today's comedy you know for example friends and and uh what is it full house the one on netflix so what are your thoughts on those well, it I depends mean, on your point of view i mean some of it's different some of it's the same hmm. i mean sitcoms it's a situation comedy they got to put people in situations that are kind of funny you hmm. know i love lucy was always trying to get trying to kind of get around Ricky and get to uh, get on stage, get on know, stage. And, right. And exactly. Be a performer. And that was kind of like the standard thing. And, and um, you know, I think, I think that's a good example of uh, setting up a comic situation that you can, that you can use and build around. I think friends was also, you know, they built their com- comedic situations around relationships really. That's right. Uh, yeah. Between among the, among the, the, um, the six you know, the friends. friends and yeah, the yeah. six friends there, but you know, a lot of the same rules applied, you know, you wanted to get people, you want to get a situation where somebody knew something that everybody else didn't, but you know, and that, that could in its, in and of itself create a comic situation hmm. um, because they had to keep that information from them, but everybody was looking for that information. Hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that's what, sitcom writers do i mean they try and build comedic situations that are going to work that they can hang hang jokes on yeah yeah absolutely let me let me ask you this question before we get into your your book if you don't Uh mind uh is crying easy or making people laugh is easy uh you know what it's an important point because in entertainment you know really what you're trying to get is an emotional response ultimately Mm -hmm. so you can start with the easy ones porn is easy. You get an emotional response pretty quickly. And then horror and horror is pretty easy too, because you're scaring people to death, you know, mm. or jolting them. And that's, that's relatively easy, not as easy. And then you get to drama where you want people to cry. Mm. And then you get to comedy. I think that's the hardest myself, but you know, just one man's opinion, getting mm. people to laugh is hard. So, but, but the ultimate goal of all these entertainments is to get an emotional response from the audience because that's well, I mean, what the audience is looking for. They well, want I mean, to be uh, entertained. Like, for example, if, I, if I'm if i in a, a hangout place and I'm saying a joke, it could be a hit or it could be just a flat <laughs> joke and no one laughs at it, right? So so that's considered, I guess, a uh, stand-up comedian, isn't it? And being flat <laughs> right in your face. What are your well, thoughts on I, that? You're talking about dying? You're talking about yeah, yeah, uh, that, the comedian yeah. gets up there and, and yeah, talks yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and just bombs. Um, yeah, there's a lot of reason comedians uh, have bad days, but you know, it's not always it's not always um, because their jokes are bad. It may be just the way the audience is at night, the way they're relating to the audience. Again, I'm not a stand up, but I yeah, I yeah, watched yeah. a lot of stand ups. Um, listen, you want to tell a joke, you want people to laugh. If they don't laugh, you, you know, <laughs> it's like a tree falling in the forest and that's right. around to here. So, that's right. yeah. So about your book, let's talk about the constant uh, comedy, uh, if you don't mind. So how did this whole book started? I mean, obviously, you you mentioned it in the beginning of the, uh, the episode right now. But was there, did you write the book first or did the title come first? Um, first of all, the title, the entire title is Constant Comedy, How I Started Comedy Central and Lost My Sense of Humor. And um, I didn't really intend to write the book when I started. I I was just writing some memoir. Hmm. And uh, one day I decided to do it, you know, do a story about something that happened in comedy. Hmm. And 
I liked it. And mm. I had a writing group and they liked it. And they mm. said, wow, you did, you, you did that stuff at comedy. We didn't know that. That's cool. Mm. And so I said, yeah. And they said, well, why don't you write more about comedy central? So I did. And then after a while, I realized, well, I had the making of, uh, makings of a book. And again, the reason I wanted to write the book, and it's a memoir, by the way, it's not a history. Hmm. It's, it's really what happened to me as Comedy Central was starting, you know, hmm. how, it, how it started up and all the things that happened to me. And it's very honest and it's very personal. I found out that when you write memoir, you have to really turn yourself inside out. You really have to be hmm. frank and honest about what you were feeling, even if, even if, it doesn't make you look like a hero. And believe me, many mm. times in the book, I don't look like a hero. You know, I, I talk about being nervous, scared, you know, upset. Uh, um, because that's, that's what I was feeling at the time. Mm. People always go through those things in business. Mm. And I realize that, you know, part of business is portraying or projecting kind of, um, power, intelligence, uh, and, and, and a certain air of certainty about what you're doing. But even though you're projecting those things, that doesn't mean, and that's really what you're feeling. And mm. that doesn't mean you're always sure of what you're doing. There were lots of times, as I said, that I thought, man, this, this comedy thing is not going to work. But, um, but, but I got through it, but I got through it. But if you don't mind, let me ask you this. Uh, sure. uh, were you more of a, more of a victim when you wrote this book? Victim in the victim. sense that, you know, it, it's like because no, I was not a victim. Off. I was not okay. a victim. I, okay. I, I don't so, want to overstate that. Listen, the book, the book's a memoir. It's got funny stuff. Hmm. It's got sad stuff. And it really tells a story of how I ended up pitching comedy to HBO and how they ended up saying, okay, yeah, let's do that. And what hmm. happened? So, no, no, I wasn't a victim. I, victim is a long way from what I was. It was a great opportunity. I was mm. so happy that HBO said, yeah, let's, uh, let's look into launching this. Mm. And then they did launch it. And then we, you know, fought very hard and worked very hard to make the channel successful. I was there for eight years. Um, and then more people, you know, listen, I didn't make the channel successful. There was a hu huge number of people making the channel successful. Sure. It's 30 years old now, I guess 31. And, 30, um, yeah. mm. and, uh, you know, there's been hundreds and hundreds of people that still are working on this thing. And over the years, it's been, spec you know, really spectacular. It's become mm -hmm. a great com comedy brand. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what do I take credit for? I take credit for pitching it, you know, saying, look, the world really needs a comedy network. Mm -hmm. I don't know why there isn't one. HBO can be good at all this stuff. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, victim, no, they gave me a job in comedy. And I didn't know awesome. anything about comedy. Mm -hmm. Uh, other than I liked it, but I was not in the business of comedy when I started. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, Art, let me, let me ask you this. Obviously you did say that you pitched it. So that was your high time that you have felt that you've kind of made it, but was there another moment uh, in your life that you have worked in there that you felt that I, I this is my mission and this is what I'm going to be doing for the next X amount of years. You know, I mean, I think that uh, every job I took on, I kind of felt personally involved with it. Hmm. More so with comedy, probably, because I pitched it, and I really felt the weight of the um, the weight of the of the project, you know, the business on my shoulders. Because if it failed, first of all, a lot of people were going to be out of business, and I felt responsible because, you know, out of job because I, I had pitched it. And I wanted it to work. And a lot of people were working on it. But that was probably the most personally I, f I took a job. I mean, I really felt it personally. But after that, you know, I went on to work at other channels. And I, you know, you got to put everything into it if you're going to make it work. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you again, Art, for, for answering that question. But let me, let me uh, ask you a fun question, if you don't mind. Um, Charlie Chaplin or Woody Allen? Charlie Chaplin or Woody Allen? Hmm. Well, that's that's apples and oranges. <laughs> How about both? <laughs> I, you know. um, I did a show with uh, 
when I, when we first started Comedy Channel about the earliest comedians, you mm-hmm. know, Buster Keaton, Chaplin, uh, Fatty Arbuckle, those guys. Mm-hmm. They were brilliant, brilliant comedians. And I think that anybody in comedy or anybody interested in comedy today, young, older, and different, should really pay attention to some of those some of those comedians. Um, and I came to love them. A lot of it was physical comedy, and physical comedy is very important. Woody Allen, kind of a different flavor because he, you know, I read his stuff in his books. He did Without Feathers, and I, uh, he was, he did stories in the New Yorker all the time. I mean, that was more of kind of a verbal approach to comedy and mm. uh, certainly had an impact on me and lots of other people who were doing comedy, writing comedy, or thinking about comedy. Mm. So, um, it's it's really both of those both of those people that you mentioned, Woody Allen and Charlie Chaplin, are very important to comedy. So let me let me ask you this here, Mel Brooks. Ah, love Mel Brooks. Amazing person. Yeah, amazing I put a quote director. of his in in the front of my book, by the way. Yes, yes, I saw that, and then that's why I'm asking this question. So if you take Mel Brooks' uh, product, you know, the all the stuff that he's done in the past. And you put that in today's world and release it. Do you think that people are going to take it offensive? Because there are certain jokes which it doesn't really resonate to the to the environment uh, today. What are your thoughts on that part? Well, comedy. You know, I mean, we're, we're we're sitting here in a very tender moment for comedy. Yeah, uh, as you know, because people are particularly um, sensitive. Hmm. to slights and uh, uh, intimations of prejudice. It makes comedy harder. It really does. I mean, I think, yes. I think one, of, one of the things that it's great about comedy is that, and, and what comedians do is they, they kind of show you the world through their eyes. And by doing so, they make you laugh. If we tell comedians they can't do certain things, they can't talk about certain topics, they can't broach certain areas, then we're really kind of limiting our ability to see the world through their eyes. Mel That's Brooks, yeah, he did He did The Producers, which is a fabulous movie, and um, in it was Springtime for Hitler. And I remember my father being very kind of put off by that because, mm. you know, Hitler, there's nothing funny about Hitler, right? And uh, mm. But Hitler wasn't the joke so much as Mel Brooks was trying to tell a story about some guys who were looking for the world's worst play and they mm. found it because some idiot had written a, a play called springtime for Hitler in the movie. Mm. And mm. they thought, okay, it doesn't get any worse than that. They're going to close that play in about 10 seconds. So it was in the service of the comedy. Mm. It was in the service of the comedy. But nowadays, if you say Hitler or you mention something on, on stage or in, in a movie or whatever, and people get offended they're more likely to turn it off or shut it down. And that is tough. That mm. is tough on comedians and tough on writers. Mm. Um, I think that what comedians do best and comedy writers do best is they walk up to the line and sometimes they cross the line. Mm. And if we don't allow them to cross the line once in a while, we're not going to get their best. Yeah, I mean, all, all the movies that I grew up with, with, uh, you know, uh, Police Academy, uh, Porky's, uh, bachelor party. I mean, those were easy comedy and those were great comedies. But when I was trying to play that, let's say recently, it came on TV. There's some few audiences. They didn't really resonate to it. So I think the environment is very different as what you have mentioned too. So I think it's very, uh, uh, different on that. What are your thoughts on that part? Well, first of all, you know, listen, not every movie, every comedy or every drama for that matter, uh, is going to hold up. Some That's right. Don't. You know, you That's watch one, right. you know, geez, when I was a kid, I saw this movie, I thought it was fabulous. And now I didn't even see what I thought was so great about it. Yeah. I think that's true of some comedies. And then the fact that, you know, you're talking about Porky's and Police Academy, those are called stupid comedies. Um, <laughs> and they were stupid comedies at the time. Um, they were, you know, really made for a particular audience. And uh, that audience still exists. They do. Uh, yes. See also uh, fraternities. Um, but, um, you know, again, they, they were crossing more lines than... Than, uh, than regular comedy. Yeah. No, than, than 
a lot of comedies or a lot of mm. a lot of uh, a lot of movies that are made today. I mean, but you know what? Society changes. You know, mm. society goes through a lot of changes. I think it'll swing back too. I think that the way um, the way comedians are really being take are being taken a task now for dealing with subjects that people don't want to deal with. Like you can't say that. You can't talk about that. Mm. You know, I think that is limiting. I think it's bad. I think in uh, I hope that in years to come, people stop doing that because mm. comedians have a point of view and comedy writers have a point of view. Mm. And why do we want to shut down their point of view? Why do we want to not hear what they have to say? Yeah. I mean, one of the greatest ways, and I, I mentioned this earlier in the in the in our conversation, one of the greatest ways to communicate is is through humor. So that's if you've got a point of view and you lecture somebody, that's one way to do it. You may put them to sleep. If you got a point of view and you're kind of talking about it in a comedic way, you're getting people to listen. Even if they don't agree with you, they may laugh. And mm. then they may consider your point of view a little mm. bit differently. So you know, again, it's all in the service of connecting with people hmm. and uh, entertaining people and making people laugh. But as I said, sometimes, sometimes some parts of the audience will take offense. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Art. And before you leave today, what are you going to be doing for the next five more years? Because you've done so much. You've seen so much. And you're writing this book or written this book and you're selling this book. And so what are you going to do for the next five to 10 years at least? And what is Art Bell going to be doing? Well, I, you know, listen, uh, there's a lot in the book that I like to talk about. I like mm -hmm. to talk to st students about it. Uh, it's about entrepreneurship, which is starting a company within a company. Mm -hmm. And I found that, that uh, young people are really interested. Young people in business are really interested and what the book has to say about persevering, taking an idea from nothing to something, to something. Um, finding ways to stick to a project as, as it's not, when it's not doing well. Hmm. Um, and also just, you know, how important it is to get your, your ideas about innovation across in a company, even if you're at, you know, very low levels in the company, you want to keep people informed of what you think could be or should be done. Mm. And I think corporations re should really constantly encourage their employees to innovate and bring those ideas to management. Mm. Anyway, so I, you know, I hope I get to talk more about that with people. And also I'm found, I, I like writing, so I'm going to write more books or I'm writing a book now anyway. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm retired from business mm. and I'm writing pretty much full time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Art, uh, I will make some arrangements to make this book and, and sign it by you and, and send it to me because I'm, I'm starting a bookshelf with all, all the you know, people that I, I speak with and, uh, and I want to cherish that too. So yeah, thank right. you and Art. Right. So before you uh, leave today, do you have any quick words to all my viewers and how was your journey on, on back to basics? Uh, well, I've enjoyed our conversation. Um, quick words. Uh, comedy is important. Uh, that's, I, I will say that comedy is important and humor is important in business. It greases the wheels of business as everybody knows. And uh, it's worth paying attention to. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about yeah, yeah, yeah. Art, thank you. Thank you again for coming on my show and, and supporting me on my the small podcast for season two. And I started this last year. So thank you again for all your support and uh, coming here. Well, you're absolutely welcome. I will mention that if people want to read my book, they can go to Amazon and look up Constant Comedy by Art Bell and there it will be. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again, Art. Thank you. So guys, we spoke with Art today and we talked about comedy and constant comedy that is right and we talked about all the basic stuff that he's gone through all the way down from when he started started this whole comedy central and what he's put into this book so guys as usual as always there is a quote from the day from back to basics and hopefully art will like this uh, quote and the quote is behind every great man is a woman rolling her eyes that's what usually happens and somebody actually said that and hopefully he'll like that 
So guys, as usual, as always, what do I always say at the end of my episode? Everything in life goes back to basics, and that's what we did today, guys. Guys, you take care, God bless, and keep on commenting all my episodes, and it will help me to understand that you are listening and you're supporting me in all the way. And the three things happens in every episode, including this one, which is content, the guest, and definitely the host, which is the best. Guys, take care, God bless, and I will see you next time on Back to Basics. Next week's episode on Back to Basics. The countryside or the, uh, the the villages, I would say, as we call in India. So they are less polluted. And uh, you often find now that uh, in, in this modern world, a lot of resorts and a lot of uh, uh, vacations are been, you know, going towards these places and not the urban areas because mm. that's where you want a break from the city life. Not only the noise, uh, but also the air pollution as a factor. So, yes, you can yeah, say that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you again. So, so let's let's talk about your your company and how you started this whole thing if you don't mind and i sure. think if i'm yeah. not mistaken you just launched it 